God bless you. I am so, oh God, I'm so excited today. Today's going to be a little bit, how can I put it? Let's just say controversial. On today's program and teaching series, we're going to delve into the topic of the pre-Hadamic civilization. Now, many of us are familiar with the biblical accounts of creation as presented in the book of Genesis. However, there are some who believe that there may have been intelligent beings. This is notion, it comes from the word of God, or should we say the sons of God that was roaming the earth prior to the events described in the incipient book of Genesis. In this series, we're going to explore the radical, mind-bending, bending, and intriguing idea from the perspective of Bible prophecy and other scriptorial data, including the book of Jeremiah, about the pre-Adamic civilization. Who was this race? And why do they still have an effect on humanity. Hey fam, you're probably wondering why the content stopped. Well, I want you to hit the like button and I want you to hit the subscribe button and also share to a friend that you think might be touched or inspired by this content. I'm not leaving until you hit it. You still didn't hit it. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the content. Budapest Symphony Orchestra proudly presents the voice of the new generation. Manasseh Jordan in the highly anticipated short film, Until Then. Until then, my eyes behold that city. Until the day, my Jesus calls. Coming soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. What else is when you go to the bank this time, <sighs> approval, the thing, the spirit of living God. My God. God says that he's singling you out because God says there's an anointing on your life. And God says, you tell old man Joseph that I'm calling him for ministry. It's Jonathan's time for a miracle. Who's Jonathan? My name's Jonathan. Jeez, my God. Stay connected to Prophet Manasseh Jordan. Text the words text MJ to 33339. That's T E X T M J to 33339. I am so excited. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than the Word of God. But today we're going to delve deeper in understanding the creation story. Now, we all have heard of the great creation story, but what most believers are a bit nebulous or might not have the right information, we're gonna delve in to what the Word of God speaks about and what takes place and really why man or humanity was created. But before I go on and teach, I want you to hit the like button and I want you to subscribe to my channel. It helps the algorithm to get around so that people can hear the teaching of the gospel. And someone might be saying, why is this important? What does this have to do with Jesus? You hear these inane comments from these dogmatic Christians that are just here to poke. It has everything to do. We have to understand what took place in the beginning. And the Word of God wouldn't mention it if it did not have to deal with why we needed to be redeemed and why we need the blood of Jesus. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not subscribed to my channel. Today, we're going to talk about the pre-Hadamic civilization. And Father, 
we give you all of the glory. We give you all of the honor. Father, allow this word to become more real to us. More real to us. Allow the word to pierce. For you said the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Speak, Lord. Speak, Father. I decrease for you to increase. And touch the precious, precious partners around the world that has been blessed by this ministry. That they're not here just to look or to be look or lose, but they're here to get a word, a word from you. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Now, let's get into this. We see two different things that takes place in Genesis, and I'm teaching on this because one of my dear, 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 um, one of my dear, dear, dear partners, he is, uh, he follows the ministry and assists me time to time, and he, said, he says, Prophet, can you teach on the contradiction that the Bible makes in chapter one? And I said, the Word of God is not contradicting itself. A lot of times when we look at the translation, the English or the way how the Hebrew is translated to the way how it shows up in the King James Version because it's Hebrew, then Greek, and then it came to the, trans to the uh, King James. There's a lot of things that misses or loses uh, translation. For example, we all know the passage where it says it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. That translation is really, really not the right thing. It wasn't a camel, but there's a word that sounds similar to that. So we're gonna get a little bit into uh, Genesis and what takes place in the creation story. The two contradictions that everyone sees in the creation story is that in the beginning, Genesis 1 chapter verse 1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then it goes on and say in verse 1 that God created the heaven and the earth. Now it says heaven here, but the older prophets would teach us, and I have it marked here in my Bible here that I got when I got ordained, it's actually heavens, it's plural. And we, we come into that revelation in the New Testament where the Bible speaks about the heavens. They are different types of heavens. And those that follow my teaching, um, make sure you look at my teaching where I talk about the three different earths, uh, the three different worlds, excuse me, the three different worlds, because you're able to see the three different heavens. You have, you have three different heavens, and then you have several different heavens in each of those three that are seven different chambers, I should say, that are in those. So when it says heavens, we know that there are different heavens and we hear a little bit about it through the apostle. He talks about the third heaven, but we're not teaching on that today. Here you begin to see, he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he talks about the creation that is made in the heavens and the earth. And then you go to verse two, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And he says, wait a second, these two things are these two things are not making sense. The issue here is that we're not understanding the chronological aspect that is taking place here. These are in two different time frames. Now, when it talks about the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the earth, when it talks about without form and void, the translation in this, and this is seen even in the Hebrew, is known as tohu vabu, tohu vabohu, tohu vabohu. And what that means is that tohu comes from the Hebrew word to mean confusion, emptiness. Now, you sit up here and say, why would God create something that is empty? And we know from the Word of God, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, we know from the Word of God that God cannot create anything that is imperfect because He is so perfect that God cannot create anything that is imperfect. Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, teaches us this because what it says here in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 is I like to go directly because I have stuff written in here that I would like to share with you precious uh, partners 
In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, it speaks about God's perfection. Now, anything that God does, because he's whole, he creates everything in full and wholeness. He creates everything in full and in wholeness. Thank you, I'm gonna go a little longer. I'm letting my camera people know. So when we see this in Deuteronomy 32, verse four, it begins to say, he is the rock, his work is perfect. Now, if his work is perfect, why would he create something in Tohu? I used to, uh, I had the honor, cause I was into, I loved uh, bespoke suits. And I went through a season where I, love suits, I have so many suits, and I got to work with a particular Jewish family um, that made many of the, many, many of the suits for many of the past sitting presidents. And so I interned there as a, as a teenager, and I would have to go there every day for work, and I'd be in the factory, and I would follow them around, and it was, in, and they were Jewish. And uh, when the boss man would come down and things were in disarray, he says, he says he would get upset at his staff and said, this is, and he was Jewish. So he would speak in Hebrew. He said, this is total tohu, tohu, tohu. And tohu, and I was able to learn the word uh, that when they say this is totally tohu, this is total confusion. So the word tohu, which is seen in uh, Genesis 1 verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This is saying that the earth was in complete disarray. Now, there is something chronologically that takes place here that is a gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Why was the earth in disarray? Well, clearly, there was a war in the heaven. Jesus makes mention of this war a little bit when he talks about how he has seen Lucifer fall like, like a lightning bolt. So we know that Jesus, or we know that God would not create things in total disarray. Psalms 111, I love the book of Psalms. Psalms, Psalms in Psalms 111, it speaks about the glorious nature of his work. Psalms 111 verse three speaks again about how, how, how the master works. He is so perfect. He is so whole in him. There's nothing that is missing. So we can only say you are holy. You are faithful. You are loving. You are not, you, you are not healing. You do not give us healing. You are healing. You do not give us daily bread. You are the daily bread. So in Psalms 111 verse three, his work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endureth forever. So there you begin to see he hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. So everything that the Lord does, he does in fullness. Now, I want to go back to Tohu, where the Bible uses this phrase, and this is actually the direct translation. It says, and the earth was without form and void. This darkness that was upon the earth. And you see this also being used in Isaiah. We're going to be going around here. We see this also being used well, I want to go here first. Yeah, we'll go here first. We see this also being used in Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45, verse 18. I want you to go there. Isaiah 45, verse 18. This is also being used where we begin to see, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it and created it, not in vain. Now it says here in vain, and I have this circled. In not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. So you see that when the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, he did not make it in vain for it to be sitting there and void in darkness. He created the heavens and earth and he formed it to be inhabited. Also, the translation here is seen in Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, verse 18, where it says that he has not created the earth in vain. The other word that is seen here is tohu. We see that word again. I have it written down here, tohu. God did not create the earth in void and in darkness. When it says vain, that's the Western or how they translate it in the English. But 
he did not create it he did not create it in tohu now all of the judaic culture and the great rabbis knew this in the beginning they knew that there was a pre-intelligent civilization that existed and this has to be discussed because there is a big movement that in some ways is a bit demonic and we want to be careful and be able to watch our ears for this and this is coming through this teaching about ancient aliens or ancient civilizations these shows are becoming so rigative and so big and part of it has some facts in it because they're talking about the pre-civilization but there is a reason why this pre-civilization begin to be destroyed now i'm going to show you again here this pre-civilization represents during the age of the dinosaurs during the age of the dinosaurs this is where we saw the reptiles that were ruling or had rulership over the earth and this is why when satan begins to choke himself he is always shown as a reptile which was a snake prior to this the reptiles would walk upright and this is why you see that every snake even to this day science has proven this but this is in the word of god that at one point these snakes actually were able to walk upright they stood upright and this is seen when you see the curse where god begins to curse the serpent or curse the whole reptilian kingdom which comes from the pre-hadamic civilization which was reptiles so these forms i don't even want to say they were humans but these humanoid forms that had some type of intelligence were cold-blooded they were cold-blooded and they would be equivalent or we see the ancestry of what existed in the pre-hadamic time through the reptile community this is also seen, and then we're going to talk a little bit about, a little deeper about the pre-Adamic civilization as well. But this is also seen, and I have some people in here listening to me while I'm teaching, so please just silence, silence your phones or the iPad, because I know people are on their iPad right now, so just silence it. But this is also seen when we get into Genesis Genesis 1 verse 28. I want to read that for you. Genesis 1 verse 28. And God blessed them. This is after God created man. He, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish and replenish the earth. Now, why would God tell you to replenish them? you would only replenish something if something else was there before. If I have a glass of water, and let's say, this is a beautiful gift someone sent me. Let's say there was water in this, for example. Let's say there was water in this. And something disrupted or disrupted the water from being in. Either I drunk it or I poured it out. And I come back to it and I says, be fruitful and replenish it. Replenishing means that there was something there that existed prior. There was something there that existed prior. This is seen in Genesis 1 verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, we got there, and multiply. Cool, he could have just said multiply. But then God says, and replenish the earth. So the earth had a particular group or civilization there. This was a civilization that was intelligent. And this civilization was animalistic, but there was also angels or sons of God at the Bible that talks about that was also roaming the earth. And some even argue that when this began to take place, this was something when the continents, the continents that we are on now, are on now, it was not these continents that existed. 
for there were different type of land masses that was existing at the time. And some even argue that this roaming or this great pre-Adamic civilization, there's debate, but if you talk to some of the Jews or some of the rabbis, they would say that a lot of this pre-Adamic civilization that existed was in the North American region. Let's take this a little further. Now, let's get into also now, who were these beings? Now, a lot of times we see that in some of the older or ancient civilizations, include, including the ancient Egyptians, there are things on the wall or iconography that points to a group that do not look human at all. And when they did come into form or, or these humanoid type, they actually looked more, more, I'm using the word alien, which does not mean the type of alien that people think, but alien meaning that they do not fit this timeline, if you understand what I mean. They do not fit this timeline. And so in a lot of times, demons, or spirits that are demonic are alien to this timeline. And so this is why when you see someone being possessed or demonic possessed, the demon still thinks that they are in the timeline when they existed. And so this is why when we see some of the writing or the drawings on the, on the, on the wall, um, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying whether or not they channeled this through speaking to fallen entities or whether or not they actually had or went into this because they were into all types of idolatry. But one of the things that is certain is that many of the things that they point to also in many ways can appear as the pre adamic group. This is also seen with the Aztecs and some of these other ancient civilizations that draws these people and they always have a reptilian type of figure. And it's so interesting because we also see the reptilian type of figure or this reptilianoid that comes into the garden, which the Bible says was one of the most, I'm using the right word, the Bible says in, in uh, Genesis, when it talks about this cunning, this cunning beast that begins to come to in the garden, the Bible says that it was cunning. So there was a type of intelligence that this beast or that this group had and they were known as being part of the sons of God. Now, I want to show you something in Job. Go to Job 38 verse 4, verse 7. Job 38 verse 4, verse 7. God speaks to Job and God challenges Job, but then he in some ways lets Job know that his ways are far beyond his own ways. But you hear a little bit of the mention, you hear God mention a little bit about this pre adamic civilization that existed. Um, the other thing that I want to state here is that the reason why, and I told you, a lot of the animals that existed during the pre adamic stage, because you had animals that were created that Adam creates. Okay, but then you have a group of animals that still exist or some of the remnants of them exist, which are seen through the reptile or the reptile uh, community. And you even see like crocodiles and all, they, they still have a little bit fragments of that pre-Adamic, that little pre-Adamic. Um, but when we get into these species or these animals, these were the animals which were the dinosaurs that were roaming during this time. And then the sons of God that was around that time were not as dense. So I wanna be clear here, they had intelligence that they would come in and out of matter. They were not as dense. And you see this with the serpent and the serpent that constantly comes that Adam gives his power to, to allow these, these disembodied beings to come back in. Okay, because once they were destroyed, their spirits 
and we understand this from even from the fallen angels, that God locks some of them in the earth or until judgment day, until the day of judgment day. Everyone will be judged on judgment day. Every believer, every non-believer, and everything on the earth will be judged, including what the fallen angels or the watchers have even been done that Solomon deals with. Now, I wanna go here because we see a little bit, we see a little bit of this. How many of you, you, you read your Bible? There's certain scriptures I read so much and I cried on that <laughs> it gets ripped because I read it so much. And I know people who love their word has also had that experience. Um, but anyway, let's go to Job chapter 38, verse four. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now hear what he's saying here. Now he's talking about the foundations of the earth, the beginning of time. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understand. Now listen to what he says to Job. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang. Now this is very important. Morning star sings. Morning star. Who is the morning star? Jesus. He is the morning star. When the morning stars, the sons of God, sing. That's another way of how God speaks of the sons of God, but that's a whole nother teaching where I get into cosmic topography of the heavens and some of the verbiage that is used in that. When the morning stars sing together and all of the sons, you see, there it goes, and all of the sons of God shouted for joy or who shut up the sea with the doors when it break forth as if it was issued out of the womb. Now this is interesting because he's talking about when the sons of God shouted for joy. And this sons of God, these sons of God is also mentioned when we begin to see in Psalms when God begins to judge the sons of God. You remember that Psalms? Haven't I told you that ye are gods and children of the Most High, but will die? This is not, God's not talking to us. He's talking to the sons of God, which were these angels. Most of them were principalities, to be honest with you, which are watchers. And I do a private course where I get into angelology, where I talk about the seven, excuse me, the nine choirs and each tier and what they mean. But these principalities made great, great, great offenses and they were known as the sons of God. And this is seen in Psalms. It's, this is seen in Psalms where the Bible speaks about that, uh, where it talks about in the scripture. And I want to, I want to, I want to go here. Um, I believe that's uh, Psalms 82. Let's go there. Psalms 82, uh, where it talks about this. Psalms 82. Let's go there quickly. Because I want you to understand that this pre Adamic group, and then we're going to go, I want to go there too. This pre Adamic group that existed the ones that were over it were the sons of God. And Lucifer, this was during the time that God entrusted Lucifer with this kingdom. And he was over many of them. And there was a transgression. Now, not every one of them transgressed, but there was a group that transgressed, that transgressed several times. We see them transgressing. We don't know exactly what the transgression is in the pre-Adamic civilization, but we do know about the transgression that takes place when they were able to commune with us and walk with us. Now, this is going to be a rather deep and certain people can handle this. When man is first created, God, and there's a scripture and I go into this, 
God allows the sons of God or the angelic hosts to help us come into our, how should we put it, our involution, not evolution, involution. And so we know that we see Michael the angel who represents Israel. So every territory had certain angels that were over. Michael represented Israel. Anytime there was anything going on with Israel, Michael the angel was there because Michael the angel understood that territory. And some could even look at it and then some scholars would say that the territory that represented that angel, that angel had some type of connection to that territory during the pre-Hadamic race or during the pre-Hadamic time. In Psalms 82 though, you hear God saying this, Psalms 82 verse one, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now that's not us people. That is not us. This is the same group that also was existing during the pre hadamic civilization. These were the sons of God and they were doing stuff. So I want you to understand this. Just like we humans have proclivities that are sometimes not of God, also the angels do too. Just like we or some of us battles with lust, just like we can battle with gorging food or gluttony, and there's nothing to be ashamed of, we all have our issues and that's why Jesus died, my friend. That's why we have a redeemer, okay? Just like we love music, just like there were sexual proclivities, these angels also have those same type of proclivities. And just like we can fall into sin or fall on the life cycle and get into a devolutionary, where we're not evolving to be more like Christ, we start devolving to be more and further away from Christ, okay? So can the angels do the same thing. And the story of Lucifer talks about a cherub angel. Most people say he's an archangel. He's not an archangel. There's nowhere in the Bible that calls him an archangel. The only place in the Bible where it talks about Lucifer, because I'm tired of these dogmatic Christians, and I, I was watching something on TV, and they're saying the archangel Lucifer who fell, he was never an archangel, he was a cherub. A cherub is actually, the ranking is actually higher than an arch. So, and, and the same thing, nowhere does it really, we know of Gabriel, but nowhere in the Bible does the Bible clearly tell us that Gabriel is an archangel. We know that from the scriptures and from what the word says. Now, if we get into some of the apocryphal gospels, that's a different conversation. But from what the word of God says, we know that Michael is an archangel and his territory is Jerusalem, is Israel, excuse me, is Israel. So here we begin to see the judgment that takes place. And this is for the transgression that the sons of God, who has been here way longer than us, they existed way longer than us. So they have a little bit of different types of knowledge and intelligence than we do because they've existed longer. God gets so angry at them and he judges them because when we were still maturing as, as God's creation, the sons of God saw the daughters of men and they created a vile, vile act. Now, some of us can look and say this type of vile act that they did where they have raped the daughters of men, and this is where these giants come from, can also be seen that there is a notion that this could have also been part of the reason that some scholars and some theologians argue that there was some type of sexual deeds that were taking place because you still see this type of aggression through some of the groups of the sons of God, okay? And they would materialize and come into human form and do their deed and they were able to come in and out. They would not stay in the physical form because most angels do or sons of God would not like the physical form because it's a lot denser. 
I want to be clear here, it's a lot denser. So when they do materialize in the physical form, they won't stay in that form because it is a lot denser. They feel uncomfortable because this density is a lot heavier. I want us to be clear and understand that. Now, God, the apostle writes and tells us that one day we will judge the angels. We represent the 10th angelic form. I didn't say we're angelic. I said we're the 10th angelic form, the 10th angelic form. But the pre-Hadamic civilization, these were earlier forms of the angelic form that lived and reigned on this earth. And Lucifer had some type of seniority as this cherub that was over this group or this civilization. But in Psalms 82, this was the group of the of beings that we see on these shows, ancient aliens, and they talk about this pre this civilization that ruled. Part of it has some truth, but part of it is also demonic. They're referring to some of the sons of God that ruled over the earth at a time when humans really did not come yet into formation. Adam or the Adamites did not exist yet. I want to be clear here. So in Psalms 82, which is very interesting, you hear God judging the sons of God for their deeds. This is where he says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Okay, this is not us. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept persons of wicked? They're judging unjustly. They're judging on basis of what they like, basis on ego. You're seeing ego. He's talking about egotism that is coming from the sons of God. The same stuff that humanity also infiltrates in. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Taking advantage of humanity. Deliver the poor and needy and rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand, and they walk on in darkness. All the foundation of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. And he tells them this. He says, you are going to die like men. You will lose your ranking. Okay? This is a big deal. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. This is another term that is used for the sons of God that we see is princes. Princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all of the nations. Now, this is something that God speaks to the sons of God because of the deeds. This was the group, the sons of God was the pre hadamic civilization that existed. And this is why when we see the serpent that comes into the garden, this is not allegorical. This is part of the pre hadamic race that was existing and that started to infiltrate the psyche of humanity. Now, let's go here, and then I'm going to close it and pray, and I'm going to bring this into conclusion. Now, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 4, verse, let's go to Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I want to go there. Now, there's a lot of great debate about this, about the chronology of this, but it's interesting what Jeremiah says here. It's very, very, very interesting. Jeremiah 4, verse 23, Jeremiah has this vision. Now, there is a debate on whether or not He's seeing this vision that is more so connected, <clears throat> that is more so uh, connected to Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity that was taking place. But chronologically, it doesn't make sense because of what 
the vision is that he says, and when he describes the maniacal, egregious destruction that takes place and how the light is taken out, this almost represents like the end of time. So you're starting to see the notion that the earth is like a matrix. And as you go into the New Testament, you hear about the new earth that will be created, which, which, which deals with it going through that pattern or that matrix again. This is seen with where it talks about the New Jerusalem, the place that we believers that are filled with the Holy Ghost and knows Master Jesus will be at. We will be living in what is known as the New Earth. It will be different than this. It will have a different density or resonance. But I'm not teaching on that right now. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I love the Word of God. Now, let's go to Jeremiah 4, verse 23. This is interesting because he's talking about how he beheld the earth. So in 23, although scholars will argue and say, well, this is about Babylon. This is about what was going on with the captivity of Jerusalem and the, and the, and the chosen people in Babylon kingdom. No, wait a second here. He's talking about the earth and you will hear him use that phrase or phraseology without form and void, which is seen. And anyone who knows the word and studies the word, you know, the meaning where something is first repeated holds resonance for the whole text. In Jeremiah 4, verse 23, it says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. It was tohu vabohu. Remember what we said in the beginning in Genesis, in Genesis 1, Verse, verse 2, Genesis 1, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Tohu vabu, vabohu. So he uses the same term here, which is interesting. The same exact term, word for word. He's talking about what takes place before humanity begins to come. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Tohu vabohu and the heavens, he says it plural, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains and lo, they trembled and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld and lo, there was no man. See, humanity wasn't there yet. No man and all the birds of the heavens were fled. Fled, meaning that they flew somewhere, these reptilian type of birds, these dinosaur type of birds. And I beheld, I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities, all of the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. The anger of the Lord is so fierce. It is so fierce. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Now this is interesting because what takes place here in verse 26, where it talks about, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place in the wilderness and all the cities thereof was broken down. Verse 23 tells us why. Verse 23, I beheld the earth and lo, it was tohu vahu, without no form, without void, and the light of the heavens, and they had no light. Here's the key thing here. The pre-Adamic civilization gets destroyed because God removes his light. He removes his glory. They got so far away from the glory of God. They got so far away from Christ that God removes his light. He took his glory away. And part of them saying that the light, if you remember Lucifer, Lucifer Ignosis, 
was the light or represents the name, the light barrier. So when Christ talks about how he saw him falling like a lightning bolt, this was part of the war that takes place between the pre-Adamic civilization. Now we know he will be destroyed from what Revelation says, that Michael will destroy him on the final bat on the in the final battle. When Lucifer meets Michael during their first standoff with over Moses' body, Michael is not strong enough to fight Lucifer, so he says, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. But we know from what the Word of God says that these two sons of God will have a final battle, and Michael will be having a higher, I want to say this in the right way, he will have higher seniority because Lucifer has fallen so deeper into devolution that he would be destroyed. Now, when this happens, we will see the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Why is this important? The pre-Adamic civilization was destroyed because they moved away from the light. They were so more focused on egotism. They were so more focused on self. They got away from the Christ. And this is what's happening to humanity now. They worship at the shrine of intelligence and no longer at the shrine of God's mercy and splendidous wisdom. This is why it's important. It is not us about talking about who was all there and these cone-headed people that existed that were part reptilian and the different types. And I can go into the genetic thing too, but the key thing to take away from this is that this civilization fell because they were no longer being led by the light of the Lord. We have to stay close to that blessed light, my friend. We have to stay close to the master. I'm not saying we're gonna be perfect, but we have to stay close to the Christ. I don't know who's watching me right now, but maybe you have lost your way. Maybe you've been going through a place of confusion and darkness. Maybe you're going through a season of where you don't understand what's the next thing you're going to do. You don't understand how you're going to make it. You've lost your light. You lost your unction. You've lost your heart for Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am the light. I am the way. No man can get to the Father unless through me. I'm feeling a tremendous anointing right now. It's so strong. I'm feeling a heat right here on my hands. Father, allow your light to shine on your people. Allow the light of your glory to shine on your people. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks a million. I love you. Thanks for being my friend. And thanks for being my partner. We have some of the best partners that has been with the ministry since I was a teenager for over a decade. And I just wanna let you guys know, you precious saints, I read the notes, I read the letters, I read your posts. Love you a million. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.